attending the latest in the ISAC webinar series. Today we are going to be talking about the master matrix. Um, we've got Gene Tinker with the DNR here to talk to us about that. If you have any questions during his presentation, you can type those in and we will get them addressed. And I don't think I have any other housekeeping announcements, so I will turn things over to Gene. Thank you. So very uh, happy to be here today. Uh, thank everybody for participating, those that are doing it today and those that will watch it in the future. Obviously, this is one of the issues that comes up every year. Um, we have a lot of concern with where confinement buildings are constructed and what neighbors and counties and such can say about them. So the Master Matrix was, uh, is a document that was developed actually before I was employed by the Iowa DNR. So, but it is one of those that it's my understanding the legislature wanted to allow counties to have some input into uh, where these facilities could be constructed. So the legislature passed a bill that said the DNR will adopt a master matrix and indicated that certain entities would participate in the development of that master matrix. And for some reason I'm having difficulty getting my uh, computer to move forward. So, but the, the legislature actually um, decided who should participate in that uh, rulemaking process. Um, my understanding, there we go, these are the entities that were um, appointed, per se, by the legislature to participate in development of the master matrix. So they developed the matrix as we use it today. The DNR then took it through the rulemaking process to allow the public to have input. Uh, but my understanding is through the rulemaking process there were no changes because these were the entities that were supposed to participate in it. Um, my take on the fact that the current master matrix was adopted through rule is that if it were decided the master matrix should change, that could be done, but these same entities would need to participate again in discussion of what those changes should be, and then it would need to go through the rulemaking process again. Uh, as I stated, this was done before I worked for the DNR. My boss told me that in order to complete the task, they had to hire a federal arbitrator to get all the entities to agree. And therefore, he had no intentions of moving forward with any changes unless the legislature mandated that we do so. Now, I do know there's been discussions during the past year that the master matrix should be reevaluated, looked at again. And I would say that's going to come from the legislature, uh, whether they tell the DNR, uh, reassemble this committee, uh, redo it, or the legislature just makes changes on their own. I suspect that unless the legislature makes those changes, there probably will not be anything changed in the master matrix as we currently use it. So the master matrix, what is it? It's a list of 44 practices that producers can choose from. These 44 practices are all things that exceed the state's requirements for environmental standards and hopefully also address concerns from the local community. It is a county tool. Um, the county gets to review it first. Actually, the county gets to decide whether or not they use it. They get to review it first and pass a recommendation on to the DNR. So it, it empowers counties to really work with producers on what they would like to see producers select within a master matrix. Um, not every producer wants to do it that way. Uh, some producers want to fill out their master matrix, submit it to the county, and say, this is what my submittal is. Um, either approve it or not. Other uh, producers actually work with their county board of supervisors and say, I really want this building to be constructed. This is the site I've selected. What parts of the master matrix would you like me to uh, implement because I really do want to get my master matrix approved? We do need to stress that it's not for every county because it does take some work, whether it be the supervisors, the zoning, whoever, Somebody needs to do some work on scoring these master matrices and working with producers. And quite honestly, some counties just don't have time for that. So it's not a tool for, for every county. 
and it's, that's the way it's designed. It's also structured as a pass-fail scoring system. It's not an A, B, C, D, E, F. It's pass-fail. We get a lot of comments about the passing score is 440 out of a possible 880. That's a passing score. It's pass-fail. That's the way it's designed. Once you get past the 440, it doesn't make it a better application just because you've got 480 or 520. All it takes is a passing score. Uh, it's a truly a pick and choose system. Most of the points available are for expanded separation distances for where a facility will be built or expanded separation distances for where manure is land applied. Uh, there are also uh, different options for practices that can be implemented. I do again want to stress this is the county's tool. It's for them to make decisions on and to move forward. So counties that elect to use are the ones who, who are involved in it. Uh, usually that's about 88 counties a year. It's not always the same 88, but generally we get about 88 counties that submit their construction evaluation resolution every year. A little bit of background, we've got two major types of animal feeding operations in the state. Confinements are totally roofed. Open feedlots are those where the animals are confined, but they are not totally, totally roofed. The master matrix is only for confinement operations, and again, it's only when counties elect to use it. So who does the master matrix affect if a county adopts a construction evaluation resolution? It's for those confinements that are planning to build, expand, or modify and they're large enough that a construction permit is required. That means there are 1,000 animal units or more. That's a minimum of 2,500 finishing pigs, 1,000 beef cattle or immature dairy cattle, 715 mature dairy cows. So it's when a facility is either building new or expanding and they have enough animal numbers that they're going to have at least 1,000 animal units. So the process. Uh, the county every year needs to pass a construction evaluation resolution and submit that resolution to DNR during January of each year. Now the law doesn't say when the county needs to adopt the resolution, but it does say that the resolution needs to be accepted by the DNR during January of each year. And that allows um, <clears throat> the county to evaluate each construction permit application with the master matrix that's submitted. Uh, it also requires counties to evaluate all applications um, and they can't do it on a selective basis. All applications must be evaluated. There is a very stringent timeline that needs to be followed and if the timeline is not followed then, then we can't continue forward using it. So what's the master matrix do? Uh, it requires applicants to exceed the minimum standards that have been established by the state and the DNR, such as increased separation distance to, to sensitive waters, increased separation distances to houses, uh, whether they be residences, uh, businesses, churches, schools. And as I mentioned before, that you have to get half the points. There's a total of 880 possible. The passing score is 440. There's also three divisions based on what the three things the committee felt were important, being air quality, water quality, and community impact. In order to get a passing score, you have to not only have to need those 440 total points, you also need to get half the points available in each of the three categories. And when you look at the master matrix document, you'll see how for each item, uh, the points available and how those points are divided up into those three different categories. A little bit of the process, um, when a county receives, um, our counties with a construction evaluation resolution adoption, when a, they submit a master matrix evaluation to the DNR after a construction permit's been received, they need to recommend approval or disapproval on that construction permit application. They need to provide a basis for why they are recommending what they are, and those comments can be based on either the master matrix or other factors. I will stress that in most cases, anything that 
the DNR is going to review needs to be based on the master matrix unless there's something really egregious that is not covered in state law. And I think in most cases, state law has covered that. To my knowledge, we have not had a case yet where it met all state requirements, but yet there was something from an environmental or community concern that was strong enough that would cause the DNR to take a, a different look at it. And then it, this allows county to appeal within 14 days any decision that the DNR should make. Here's the example I always use. Item number 14, as you see in the bottom of the screen, is an installation of a filter, which is to reduce odors from confinement building exhaust fans. We know that filters can reduce odor, but they're not required by state law. This is an option that can be an add-on. So the producer could get 10 points. So if you installed filters, you could get 10 points on the master matrix. Eight of those points would go towards air quality. No points towards water quality because this is an air issue. It's not going to have any impact on water. And then two points on community impact because obviously we're going to try to control a little bit of odor concerns and so the community should have a little bit more support, support for it. So my question is, it says a filter. What is a filter? That's for the county to, de to decide. The other thing I want to point out is on the bottom it always states the design, operation, and maintenance plan for the filter uh, must be included. So that plan is going to be dependent upon the filter that's utilized. So is a filter a furnace filter that you're going to put over a uh, exhaust fan? Or is a filter this biofilter that was developed up at the University of Minnesota where you can see that exhaust air goes through a bed of wood chips and the bacteria living in those wood chips actually uh, consume those elements that create odor. Well, the master matrix doesn't say which filter should be utilized. It's up to the county to decide what is their definition of a filter. Um, when the DNR reviews it, if they do, um, what we're primarily going to look at is to make sure that design, operation, and maintenance plan matches the filter that the county has decided. So if the county decides that the definition of a filter is a biofilter, we're going to make sure that the design, operation, and maintenance plan that's submitted is for a biofilter and not for a furnace filter because obviously we've got two very different kinds of filters here. And so if we look on the bottom where it says design, operation, and maintenance, we're going to make sure that plan matches the filter that the county has decided the applicant needs to meet. Now, for the DNR standpoint, DNR by law is required to approve a permit if the county recommends approval meaning they've got a passing score on the master matrix, and if it meets all the state's requirements, meaning what's in the Code of Iowa and also the DNR rules. So if the county recommends approval, gave it a passing score on the master matrix, the DNR will not review the master matrix, but will take those items that were selected and include them in the construction permit, um, and it will uh, issue what we call a draft uh, construction permit, basically indicating we plan to issue the construction permit. The county has the option to appeal this, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. Likewise, the DNR must deny the permit if it doesn't meet state law or DNR rules. Even if the county gives a master matrix passing score, if it doesn't meet one of the minimum requirements for the state, the DNR is going to deny that permit. DNR also denies if the permit applicant doesn't get a passing score on the master matrix. And if that's the case, let's say a county gave it a 400 score and it takes a 440 to pass, well, by law, then the DNR reviews the master matrix as well. And if the DNR confirms that non-passing score, um, then the DNR will deny the construction permit because it didn't meet the minimum score on the master matrix. 
there are appeal rights. Uh, it's always important to know that um, the Environmental Protection Commission, which is the body of Iowans that is uh, nominated by the governor and approved by the Senate, um, they get to hear appeals and they consider input from the county, the applicant, and the DNR. I can tell you the DNR's comments are always whether or not the minimum requirements have been met. Uh, the DNR does not decide whether or not this is a good application, a bad application. Uh, they're st simply stating whether or not the minimum requirements have been met. So I think we've got a question. Alrighty, the question is, can a county establish by resolution or ordinance the type of criteria that you're talking about, for example, the type of filter, as a set requirement that must be met? My understanding is that, yes, a county can establish those requirements, and that's always been my recommendation to counties so that producers in that county know ahead of time what that county's minimum requirements are going to be. Uh, to me, that's, that's very straightforward because it puts it out there so everybody knows what the expectations are. Now, I'm not aware of any counties that have done that um, because obviously it takes time and, and everybody's busy, but by establishing that ahead of time before they ever receive an application, it's an unbiased and it puts out there so everybody knows uh, what the expectation is. And the DNR will abide by whatever that county establishes um, if it's one of those things like a filter that allows the county to decide what the minimum requirement should be. Um, if it's something like an increased separation distance, um, you know, there's always discussion about where do you measure? Where's point A? Where's point B? Those things are always uh, established in the rule, and so there's no discrepancy on that but for something that's uh, up to the county to decide, like what is a filter, uh, the DNR will abide by whatever that county decides for each of the counties that would do so. That is the county control where each county gets to decide what their minimum criteria are. And the DNR doesn't establish the minimum criteria. We just make sure that uh, plan uh, and maintenance program matches whatever the county has decided. Okay, moving on. I have another question really quick. Oh, yes. Uh, what percentage of permit applications are denied by the DNR in a given year? Uh, we actually have very few or very low number of, of applications that are denied. Um, I can share with you a little bit about how that normally occurs. Uh, most applications are submitted by uh, companies in the state that this is their business, they know what the minimum re requirements are, they know how to submit the applications, and so for the most part the minimum requirements are going to be met. So from a master matrix standpoint, the way it normally works is if a county denies a master matrix, um, and so the DNR is then going to review the master matrix. In most cases, that application is withdrawn before the county ever, uh, or before the DNR ever makes a decision on it. So the number that we deny is, is actually very low, simply because when it's to the point where the DNR will deny it, the application withdraws it. So I would say we're less than 5% a year. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. We were talking a little bit about appeals. Um, if there is an appeal, EPC uh, has a number of options. Uh, they can um, affirm what the DNR has, has decided. They can deny. Or in some cases, they can modify the permit, which generally means they do a little bit of negotiating with the applicant to see if they can't come up with something that's... Um, midway between what the applicant had initially planned to do and whatever the concern is that uh, the county has. And in, in some cases they can uh, negotiate a modification, um, but the EPC does have a number of options there. If the applicant or the county uh, is not 
uh, happy with the decision of the Environmental Protection Commission, they can go ahead and appeal that decision to district court. Uh, if the applicant is the one who appeals, they actually get to choose where that appeal goes. It can either go to EPC, or if they want, they can go to a judge, as in a contested case. A uh, little bit of, of, of my um, uh, personal advice here is county appeals um, should generally be based upon a master matrix um, where the county did not approve adequate points. We've had a couple of instances where a county has agreed with the minimum points on the master matrix and recommend denial even though they approved adequate points on the master matrix. So a couple of things have happened there. Number one, when the county gives a passing score to the master matrix, that prevents the DNR from reviewing the master matrix. Um, we, we get to include the requirements of the master matrix into the construction permit, but the DNR does not get to review the master matrix. So a passing score prevents the DNR from reviewing. Um, this 65, uh, chapter 65.5, parentheses 3, is what is called the uh, department evaluation rule, which is a rule that the department got passed a number of years ago, which said, in addition to all the things that the legislature has decided are important, the DNR will also consider these other things. And there was a whole list of things that we could go through, and if we felt uh, there was environmental risk, we could require changes to the construction permit application or we could deny it. So that was the DNR's attempt to um, have a little bit more control above and beyond what the legislature had provided. The Administrative Rules Review Committee objected to the rule. They didn't say we couldn't adopt the rule, they just objected to it. And so we've been advised by legal counsel not to use it. So if a county has an application that they're not supportive of, um, they really need to take a very strong look at the master matrix and whether or not a passing score should be given on the master matrix. Uh, because if they give it a passing score, it prevents the DNR from uh, doing a review of the master matrix. What is the county's role if they don't adopt the master matrix? If the county does not adopt the master matrix, they still get to um, submit comments to the DNR, but they don't get to appeal. So the appeal rights are only for those counties that actually participate in the master matrix process. Now, I should also state that the a lot of counties probably don't feel this is appropriate, but the way the law is worded, when county residents have concerns about a construction permit application, the law says those concerns all need to go to the county, and the co county will compile those and submit them to the DNR as one package. And so we get a lot of residents that call the DNR and say, well, I don't think this construction permit should be approved because of, and we have to kindly tell them, well, we agree or, or don't agree, but you really need to give your comments to the county board because by law, we can't take those comments directly. They need to come through the county board of supervisors. So if the uh, board elects not to use the master matrix, so they don't adopt a construction evaluation resolution. They can still submit those comments. Uh, they can still make a recommendation to the DNR on whether or not a construction permit should be granted or denied, but they've lost their appeal rights. And um, I think that's a pretty important part because as much as uh, the DNR always thinks we get it right, sometimes we have a commission that doesn't agree with us and so they tell us to backtrack a little bit. So, any follow-ups on that? Okay, we'll move on. A little bit of a summary for the timeline. This is for when a construction permit is submitted. 
the first place the application goes is to the county. And the county has to receive that application and sign for it. And the reason it goes to the county and the county receives a copy is so if neighbors want to look at it, they can look at it in their county courthouse as opposed to having to go to a DNR office to review that application. So after the county signs that they've received the application, the applicant, the producer, takes another copy of the application to the DNR with that signature that says the county has already received this. If they don't have the signature page with it, DNR won't accept it because the law says the first place it goes is to the county. So once the DNR receives it, we'll go through it, make sure the application is complete, and we will fax a public notice to the county that they have to publish public notice that a construction permit in the county has been received. That's for all counties, regardless of with, whether they use the master matrix or not. So the county has 14 days to publish that notice. If there's a master matrix, the county gets to review that, and they need to submit their recommendation to the DNR within 30 days. Now, there's a few things that happen in the, in the interim. Uh, DNR staff will do a site visit to determine whether or not uh, required separation distances are met. We always offer for the county to come along with us during those site visits so they can review what our staff are doing on, on reviewing uh, established separation distances. If the master matrix has additional separation distances, the points have been taken for, the county can, can check on those at that time. We have kind of a follow-up question to the filters. Um, they're wondering if they heard you correctly that you can pass a resolution for filters being required on all future units that are built. No, I, I must have misspoke if that's what your, your question was. The, what I was trying to say was the county can establish a resolution for what type of filter would be required if they selected that option in the master matrix. The county cannot establish any requirements that are above and beyond the state's requirements. A filter is not a requirement for the state. A filter is an option that can be utilized to get points on the master matrix. So the county could establish what kind of filter um, they would approve for a master matrix scoring, but they cannot establish that all uh, confinements utilize a filter. They cannot require that any master matrix that be submitted include the filter. They can negotiate with the applicants to do that, but they cannot require that. Thank you. And one more. What impact, if any, does the county uh, CAFO moratorium carry? Uh, my understanding is that a moratorium established by a by a county is basically a suggestion. Um, my understanding is that state law is very strict in that counties do not have the authority uh, to adopt that, just as they don't have the authority to adopt more stringent regulations than what the state has got. Uh, the legislature has been very um, straightforward about they want one set of standards for the whole state, and if counties want to modify those standards for their county, utilizing the master matrix would be the process to do that. Now I understand a number of people don't feel the master matrix is stringent enough for counties that <clears throat> want to have more say in what can be approved or denied, but at this point in time, that is the procedure we've got in the state. So, back to our timeline. The county publishes notice in a, in a paper with significant circulation in their county um, that a construction permit application has been received. They review that master matrix. They can go on the site visit with the DNR when they go out to confirm separation distances, look to make sure there aren't some um, wellheads there that maybe the applicant didn't know about. Um, determined to make sure all required separations or distances are met. 
After the site visit, scoring the master matrix, the county then submits their recommendation to the DNR. And that recommendation includes what was their score on the master matrix? Was it a passing score, non-passing score? Do they recommend denial or recommend approval of this construction permit application? The DNR then has 60 days from that date of start, so 30 days after they get the recommendation from the county, uh, they have to submit a decision to the applicant and to the county. Now, I've got on here continuances are possible. A continuance is basically uh, extending out the deadline. Counties are not allowed continuances, although in many times the county can work with the applicant to use a continuance. DNR is allowed one 30-day continuance. Applicants are allowed um, unlimited continuances. Normally where, where this comes up is if the DNR says we need more information about something and the applicant needs to get that information, if the DNR doesn't have the information, they're going to deny the permit because they don't have the information they feel they need to approve the permit. At that point, the applicant will use a continuance to stretch out that 60 days to 90 days so they can get that information into the DNR. In some cases, they've stretched it out to 120, 150 um, in order to get the information that's needed. And sometimes that happens to be negotiations with neighbors so that they don't have people who are opposed to their application. From the DNR standpoint, once we have a continuance, we stretch out that deadline until the applicant says move forward uh, if we have the information we need to issue the permit, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll issue the denial. Once again, 14 days after that preliminary decision comes out, that draft permit that's issued, the county can appeal. Uh, if there is no appeal received at the end of 14 days, the DNR will then issue that final permit for the uh, facility to be built. How often is a DNR permit approval overturned due to a county appeal? Very rarely do we have uh, EPC overruling the DNR. Um, not that it hasn't happened. There have been cases where counties have made their appeal and the Environmental Protection Commission has felt, yes, um, this is not appropriate. In most cases, um, what ends up happening is there's some negotiation and the applicant offers to do some additional things so that the commission will then go ahead and agree that the permit should be issued. Um, sometimes that's things such as planning a windbreak. Uh, it's actually things that are included in the master matrix, um, but sometimes there's negotiation, uh, but it's very rare that the commission will overrule the DNR. And the reason for that is it comes down to the wording in the Code of Iowa where it states, if the minimum requirements are met, the DNR shall issue the permit. So if the minimum requirements are met, the DNR issues that intent to issue the permit you know, in most cases, the DNR is correct in that all minimum requirements are met. The appeal allows the applicant, the county, neighbors that are uh, working with the county to work with the Environmental Protection Commission to discuss that some more. Um, as I mentioned, there have been some overturns, but in most cases, after some negotiation, the facility is built anyway. Um, but I'm not, I guess my point is that appeals are worthwhile because uh, generally the county does um, come up with a solution that's probably not restricting the facility from being built, but it's modification so that uh, we adopt some of those practices that will have lesser impact on the neighbors. Okay, so a little bit of a summary for the master matrix. It gives the producer freedom to choose those practices that they will implement. They should be environmentally friendly. They should be community friendly. 
It also gives the county the opportunity to have input with the producers on what they'd like to be see done. Now again, different counties operate this differently, but in many cases the producers contact the county ahead of time so they can work together on coming up with a master matrix that the county is going to go ahead and approve. In my opinion, the best thing it does, it allows the county and the, and the producer to talk, which I think communication helps with a lot of our issues. I had my contact information at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Here's the six field offices that we've got out in the state. Um, so wherever your county's at in the state, it indicates where your field office is. Staff from this office are the ones that will be going out to the site to do a site survey before a construction permit would be issued or denied. They're also the ones that you would be working with directly on um, any discussions. Recently we had um, one resident called and said, you know, I used to live on that property. There's an old well on there that was never properly plugged. Those are things that we need to know. The county didn't have any information about that, but according to this residence, there was. And so those are the kinds of information we need from, from residents to go out and verify that because if there is an old well there, we need to make sure that we know where it's at so separation distances are met or that it be properly plugged so that it's not a, a conduit to the groundwater anymore. Are you ready? I'm ready for any questions you've right. got. Uh, who refused the who reviews the construction site once the building is completed to ensure that all master matrix scores are met? Good question. We, um, our, our field staff, the ones who would go out and do that site survey ahead of time, are also the staff. It may not be the same person, but it would also be the staff that would go out to determine that everything is met, um, and they will actually issue uh, a report back to the engineer that issued that construction permit and when they say everything is met, everything was built as, as needed, the uh, review engineer that issued the construction permit will also issue what we say approval to populate, meaning we know you've done it correctly, you can now put animals inside that barn. There should not be animals inside a barn with a construction permit until DNR has given them approval to populate the building. Ready, a two-part question. If the county adopts a resolution or ordinance setting out specific standard, standards that must be met for criterion, can it include a requirement for a pre-application conference? And can a county establish local fees for the cost of its review? As far as the fees, that is something I'm not aware of. Um, my first guess, and I'm going to say guess, is that probably not because um, the fees associated with the animal feeding program are established by the legislature. Um, it doesn't mean it couldn't be something that a county could um, adopt as, like some counties have a, as a good neighbor policy. Um, now having rambled, I forgot what the first part of the question was. Can it include a requirement for a pre-application conference? Uh, Pre-application conference, um, I don't know that a county can require it, but they certainly could request it. And that's what we've done with a lot of our more um, complicated um, applications that we've got in, where the applicant is going to have an engineer that's going to design. This is a lot more for our open feedlot runoff control programs. We actually have a pre-designed meeting with the applicant and their engineer so everybody's on the same page and they all know what's expected and how to move forward. I don't think a county can probably require that um, a, an applicant do that, but they could surely adopt that as a good management practice or a best management practice that they would expect um, applicants to follow if somebody chose not to follow that. I don't know what kind of um, teeth the county would have to say you can't move forward. But to me, it's just a good practice for, for counties to get in so everybody knows what's, what's coming up and they can have discussion ahead of time.
we have a few minutes left. If anybody else has questions, we can type those in and we'll get them addressed. Once again, I, I really want to express my appreciation to the Association of Counties for allowing us to present this. We know it's something that, um, especially this time of year when counties need to make a decision on whether or not they want to participate in the master matrix process. Uh, I do know there have been entities that have crisscrossed the state meeting with county boards of supervisors, trying to stress to them why they should or should not follow the process. Um, so I, I commend all supervisors and, and county staff that are trying to learn more about it. Um, and I do want to stress that we in the DNR are very much willing to work with everybody as far as how we implement it, how we make the decisions, and how we can work together because it's um, stressful enough to get through this when there aren't opposing sides. Um, it just makes it a lot easier if we can all talk ahead of time so we know where we're headed. And we emailed out the uh, sample resolution if you decide to participate in the master majors next year. Um, we can probably also get that posted with the webinar recording so it'll all be in one spot if you want that again. Um, and this, this was recorded to be able to go back and listen to it again, share with others, and we'll also have the PowerPoint um, and the other accompanying documents up with that as well. Uh, one more question came in. Are lot lines addressed in the state code? Does the measurement start at the front door of the property line, or the property line, excuse me? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, when we have measurements for animal feeding operations, it is not property line. It is the closest point of the um, livestock facility to the closest point of the entity of concern, whether that be a house, a business, uh, a church, whatever. Um, it's the closest point of um, the building that's connected to where people are established. And I use that as my example. If a house has got a garage next to it and the garage is the closest thing to the confinement operation, if that garage is connected to the house, we will measure to the closest point on the garage. If the garage is not connected to the house and there's nobody living in the garage, the garage is just housing cars and lawnmowers and such, then we measure to the closest point of the house. So it makes a difference on, on whether things are established or not. We also clarified in a recent rule package that the measurement from the livestock operation is the closest point of the facility that houses animals or stores manure. So if the closest point is a office building that is on a slab that's not above manure storage, we would not measure from the office building we would measure from the actual livestock facility that houses animals or stores manure. Likewise with feed storage bins. If they're the closest part but they're not sitting on top of a manure storage structure, we ignore them when we take the measurement and we go to the closest point of the actual building itself. Well, seeing no other questions, I, I guess I'd like to thank everybody for their participation today. Oh, we might have one more coming in. Are there any regulations on the horizon from the legislature that you are aware of? Very good question. Um, I am not aware of anything that will definitely be coming from the legislature. I do know there was a lot of discussion last year about different options. And I can say most of those were um, implementing some of the requirements for larger facilities down to smaller facilities, things like a manure management plan. Um, construction permits are needed for confinements over 1,000 animal units. Manure management plans are required for confinements over 500 animal units. There has been some discussion about lowering that so smaller operations, such as those with 200 or 300 animal units, would be required to get to uh, develop and implement a manure management plan, which is a best management practice anyway. But 
they would actually submit that to the DNR. That is one that I've heard a number of times. Um, at this point, I'm not aware of any pre-bills that have been submitted, so I'm not aware of anything that there's actually traction moving forward. I just do know that there's been a lot of discussion, and I guess my point would be if you as a county supervisor or a county employee do have ideas for how we could improve animal feeding regulations, um, now would be the time to talk to your elected officials ahead of time before they get to Des Moines and before they get too busy so you can very appropriately address your concerns with them, outline some possibilities for how we can make some improvements so they've got time to think about it before they get down to Des Moines. There's been a lot of concern recently about stringing together CAFOs under LLC but not needing to meet the matrix. How is this handled? Uh, right now, we um, are trying to determine who the owners of those LLCs are. Our staff have been provided with um, a list of criteria we can look at to try to determine if there is common ownership in those LLCs so we can tie them together and require them to get a construction permit. Um, but as far as any change in the law um, to, to change how this is done, I don't know that there's anything coming. Um, it's certainly something that our staff have been concerned about. Uh, we've talked a lot with our legal staff and right now our, our uh, goal is to determine who has ownership in those LLCs to see if we can tie together a common ownership and therefore require a construction permit if we can establish common ownership. Uh, if we can't establish that common ownership, then we accept what's been submitted. Are all CAFOs ag exempt? And as an example, even corporate hogs? My understanding is yes, um, and we get those tax exempt forms in, and when our staff review them, um, they're basically all looked at the same regardless of who the ownership is. So the, my understanding is a simple answer is yes. Can there be special property taxes added to these CAFOs? That I don't know. I'm not, I'm not aware of any option for that to be the case. I'll, I'll go out on a little bit of a limb here with a, a question I get a lot that hasn't come up today. And um, a lot of it is, is counties being concerned with road use and road damage as we get, especially some of these large manure tankers hauling manure on roads. And the, the response I give everybody is that um, the county is responsible for the roads and the county gets to make a decision on how roads are handled. Um, if somebody wants to build a new building at the end of a grade B road, I don't know that the county is required to upgrade that road so that somebody can build there. Likewise, I do know of one county that had a, a road damaged and they felt it was due to manure hauling and so they fixed the road and sent the bill to the manure applicator. Um, I think they then followed that up with passing a resolution that states whenever there is damage due to a road, due to hauling manure, or it could be feed, construction materials, whatever, they will send the bill to whoever they feel the um, entity is that would be responsible for that. They put a caveat in there that if the manure applicator or responsible party felt the road was in bad shape beforehand, they need to establish that before they start using it to verify that they did not cause the damage. So to me, that's, that's up to a county as to how they deal with that because they are the ones who get to decide where their dollars are spent. And if um, they have an entity that's causing damage to a road and they feel that entity is the one responsible, I, I feel it's the county's ability to pass that expense on if they feel that's necessary. I don't know if that's sound advice or not, but it's what I give counties. So I'll pass it on to everybody at this time. Well, thank you everyone for your participation today. And Jean, thank you so much for your time and sharing this information with us.
Always willing to uh, talk to people about livestock operations. My contact information is there, and I uh, welcome the opportunity to discuss with folks so that we can all make good decisions.